<clears throat> Hello everybody. So tonight we're looking at the learning curve. We've spoken about the learning curve a lot in the first 20 slides. And what is the learning curve? How does the learning curve work? And this learning curve is from Henry Ford's learning between 1909 and 1923. We're currently in 1922. So this is from more than 100 years ago to 99 years ago. And we're going to look at what this is, how it works, and then we're going to say why have people forgotten about the learning curve? What is it about management science, strategy, leadership, etc., that is currently causing, especially since 1973, since the oil crisis, constant crises, uh, electricity crisis, water crisis, food crisis, sewage crisis, waste crisis, overfishing crisis, sea increasing acidity crisis, body acidity crisis, cancer crisis, health crisis, pandemic crisis, inflation crisis, all these crises because we've forgotten how to learn. So this is what Henry Ford discovered. Let's go and look here. This is, um, this says unit costs in thousands of dollars. So over here, you've got when Henry Ford was producing 10,000 cars, which one would expect the Model T car between, at 1909, it was costing about $4,000 for 10,000 cars. So that's at that point. And you can see here, let's say $3,000 for 12,000 cars. Okay. As Henry built more cars, here you can see when he got to 100,000 cars, okay, the price had come down from just over $3,000 per car to about $2,500 a car. Now, we then look when it's another 10x. So it's 100,000, so we got 200,000, 300,000, 400,000. So like at about 500,000, the price has come down again from here, 2,500 to 2,000. So we got from 10,000 to 100,000, we reduced the price by $500, and then from 100,000 to 500,000 by another $500. And then we get to a million where the price is another $200. And by the time we get over here, let's say this is 10 million, the price. So now we've gone from 100,000 to a million, that's 10 times. And then from a million to say 10 million, we've gone down to $1,000. So when Henry Ford started in 1909, making 10,000 cars a year, they were costing about $3,000 a car. And when he got to 14 years later, and making, say, 10 million cars a year, the price had come down to $1,000 a car. And how did he do this? How did he bring the price down all the time in this learning curve? The learning curve means when you make something the first time, it costs a lot. So, for example, I spent from 2004 to 2008 learning how to install a renewable energy system, and I installed my first one. In 2008, 2009. So it took me five years to do that. And I put about 10,000 hours into that. Of the 10,000 hours, I put a thousand hours into deciding what I needed, reading manuals. So that you could say was very expensive. And then I installed other systems. I did a lot of consulting. I spoke at a lot of conferences and I learned how to install new systems. And between 90 and between 2008 and 2020, 12 years, the price of systems came down 12 times. So in other words, the, the PV price, the inverter price, and the battery price came down 90% from 2008 to 2020, for renewable energy at least. So there's the learning curve at work. The inverters got more efficient. For the same amount of money, you got a better inverter. So the inverter that I paid 35,000 Rand for, uh, divide by 16, say about $2,000, so the inverter I paid about $2,000 for in 2008 gave me 3 kilowatts. And the inverter that I bought 12 years later gave me 8 kilowatts. And more capabilities such as I have the app on my cell phone. There was no app in 2008. It cost a lot of money for me to measure what was happening on my inverter. Uh, instead of 1 kilowatt, I got 6 kilowatts of PV. Um, instead of 12 kilowatt hours of lead acid, where I could only use four kilowatt hours on a regular basis, I got 12, I got 15 kilowatt hours of lithium iron 
where I can use 12 kilowatt hours on a regular basis. So the price performance is so much more effective. And that's because of the learning curve. But now look what happened between 1973 and then say 2008 and now 2020 for coal power stations. The cost has dramatically increased. Look at nuclear power stations. Not only has the cost increased, but even for countries like France, which are experts at, at, at nuclear power, other countries which are experts, we're going to look at some pictures later on in this presentation another night. You can see that uh, com countries and companies are unable to make nuclear power stations cheaper, and also they don't know how to make them quicker. In fact, it probably takes two or three times longer today to make a nuclear power station than it did 30 years ago. Part of the reason for this is because maybe there are 20% of the number of people graduating in nuclear science today compared to 30 years ago, which is a problem that was discussed by Amory Lovins in about 2007. He produced a paper about nuclear power, and he explained all the reasons uh, that would happen in the next 20 years with nuclear power. And although everybody says it's so clean, once you switch it off, you've got to maintain that power station for a thousand years. We don't know. When I was a child, 40 years ago, and we spoke about nuclear power, we were told that by, 20, by 2000, we would know how to recycle nuclear power stations. But we're currently 22 years after that, and we still don't know. So gas power stations, has the gas price come down? Has the oil price come down? I mean, look at gas prices in America. And in South Africa, we call gas a gas, a vapor that you burn, whereas here we call petrol petrol, and in America, petrol is gas. So what you put in your car and look at the price that's going up all the time. And why is that? Is it easy to blame a war in Ukraine or Russia? Even whilst at the same time, America has become self-sufficient in energy, and therefore international prices should not be affecting the price of gas or petrol or diesel or the fuel that goes into your car in America. In South Africa, 30% of our petrol and diesel is made from coal. And therefore, that component should not be affected by international oil prices. We also have local gas production. We also have local canola oil production, for example. We export canola oil. So therefore, our canola, canola oil price in South Africa should not go up yet. It's gone up two to three times since January. Sunflower oil, South Africa produces almost all the sunflower oil it needs. Sunflower oil prices also, has also gone up because they're priced internationally. So we have this problem, a number of problems. One is the learning curve is not working most of the time. If you look at, say, a 4,000 Rand computer, divide by, say, 15, what's that? Let's say 4,000 divided by 15. He's doing a calculator, 200. Let me just do my calculator here. 4,000 divided by 15. Say $250, $300. If you bought a $300 computer in 1984, and that would be a big desktop computer, okay? Um, today, you buy a $300 computer, you get a laptop, which is really light. It's got a color screen. Uh, it's got a battery that lasts 10 hours. So you're really getting a lot more for your money when you buy, but the price of the computer is the same. So now if you took a Mercedes-Benz car that cost you, say 25,000 Rand, 20 years ago, today that car might cost you a million Rand, which is a 40 times increase. But yet, if the, if the car, if the learning curve in the car was the same as the learning curve in the computer, the car would still cost the same as the computer costs. So why are cars costing more and more? Why are Mercedes and BMW and even Ford themselves and so many other companies, Toyota, Lexus, Aston Martin, why are, they car, why, why are these car companies' prices going? Even Tesla. Elon Musk said his car prices would come down in real terms every year, and they did for a while. And, of course, he bought out the Model T, I think it was. What was it? It was the Model X. No, his first car. It was the open car. You remember that one? And then he bought out the Model S. It was called the Roadster. He bought out the Roadster. Then he bought out the Model S. And then he bought out the X. 
and then he brought out the three, and then he brought out the Y. And the I got I got sidetracked because you know Elon Musk has got sexy cars, and the R is the roadster, but the R isn't in the sexy; it's in the second word. So the yeah, if you look at sexy cars, S E X Y C A R S, you'll find those are the first letters of all of Elon's cars. But he couldn't call the Model E a Model E because of Mercedes having the E trademark, and so he had to call it a three, which is an E backwards. Um, hence, he has a Model 3. But Elon's car should be coming down in price every year, in real terms. Elon's managed to produce rockets at maybe 10% of the cost of NASA because he doesn't have sunk costs. In other words, NASA built the first rockets. It cost, let's say it cost them a billion dollars to build a rocket in 1950. Well, in 2020, when they were building rockets, they were still recovering costs from 1950. What they should have done is said, after 20 years, those costs are sunk costs. Those projects are over. We're not going to recover costs anymore. We're going to work on new designs. And that's exactly what Elon does. You see, governments are unable to do this. Hence, we have something called a natural monopoly in the so-called electricity industry, where a government goes and builds a power station for $10 billion. And then because of that huge investment, they call it a natural monopoly so that no one can compete. And then when there's a new product that supersedes that product, then there's something called a stranded asset. And I mean, if I go and invest a million rand in a product or project, let's suppose I invest $50,000 in something and something better comes along. I can't go and claim from my clients for the $50,000 investments I made. But if the government spends $10 billion on something, then even if they're saying in five years' time that costs half as much, the government will say, no, we have to pay those costs. We have to pay for the stranded asset. There's no learning curve. So we have lots of terms coming on here. Stranded asset, learning curve, sunk costs, natural monopoly. There was a guy called Samuel Insull in 1920 who was the owner of the Chicago electricity utility. And he said, when we go and build big utilities, it's going to cost us such a lot of money. And JP Morgan and all those guys came along and Andrew Carnegie to with their money to invest. And they all said, no, we will invest. But then we we want to know that we're going to be able to sell our product. We need base load. So base load isn't how much the power station will provide. Base load is how much the big off takers will take. For example, a mine or a smelter or a steel manufacturer, for example, those guys need a lot of electricity. And they're prepared to buy, pay, sign 30-year contracts at a certain rate. And so that's called the base load. Load means load. It means off-take. It doesn't mean supply. So you'll hear ESCOM and other utilities talking about base load. There's no such thing. I mean, when ESCOM built a, a five gigawatt power station, they go to their smelters and they go to the big users. They go to the big car companies in Pretoria. They go to the big smelters in Richards Bay. They go to the, the big, um, they find out about new shopping centers that are being built that need a lot of power. They go to the data centers that need a lot of power. And they say, how much power do you need? How long will you buy the electricity for? And then because of that, they sell 70% of the electricity in advance. That gives them the money to buy to build the power station. And therefore, this business about ESCOM saying we need 10, 20, 30% increases per year, it's completely false. The only reason that it's happening is because of inefficiency and inability to build a scientifically impossible power station, which I talked about in 2010, when I said that Madupi and Kusile were impossible to build. And if you want to talk to me about that, please ask questions. I can spend hours telling you why Madupi and Kusile coal power stations are impossible. And they're, not, they're meant to be running at 92% efficiency. Madupi was meant to be completed in 2015. It's still not complete. It doesn't meet its environmental requirements. The EIA, the Environmental Impact Assessment, is not being met. It's polluting the environment, and it's only running at about 40% efficiency. I compare it to saying, well, if you made fries, chips, in chip oil. So you put your sunflower oil in a, in a pot, you made your hot chips, you ate your chips, and then you took the, the waste oil, and instead of discarding of it properly, you put it in your car. And then your car goes three miles, five kilometers, and then breaks. Then you, the engine seizes. Then you spend the next three weeks fixing the car, and then you run it on the same oil. Because for some reason, you're not learning. You know, if, if, if I put waste oil in my car, Okay, because I would, let's try this out. And the car went five kilometers or three miles and then broke. I would say, okay, we need a better quality oil. But for some reason, the government doesn't do that.
So Sam and Ensar created something called a natural monopoly. And if you look in nature, the word natural comes from nature. Natural has the word nature in it. There is no monopoly in nature. If the lions start getting too many, then they eat too many buck. And then the buck die off. And then the lions die because there's not enough buck. There's not enough meat. And then the buck start producing more. And then they increase a lot, and then the lines can increase. And this relationship is called this relationship is called the Lotka Volterra equation. Look it up, Lotka Volterra. So the learning curve must be applicable everywhere. Must be applicable in renewable energy, must be applicable in computers, must be applicable in cars, must be applicable in food, and must be applicable in water. You know, with the with the shortages of water in Cape Town. The dams that we have can only supply 600 million liters of water a day. But Cape Town currently needs about between 1.2 and 1.5 million liters of water a day. So we should be desalinating between 600 and 900,000, sorry, between 600 and 900 million liters of water a day. So whatever those numbers are, we need double the water that we, that we, that we, that we have right now. I'll put in the notes how much the water should be. So the point is we don't have this. Now, if you do the calculation, when you build a really big water power station, such as the one, the ones in, 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 in America, on the west coast of, of uh, California, and the ones in Israel, you'll discover that they're making water for about 8 rand a kiloliter. But I'm paying 45 rand a kiloliter. And I'm only getting 15 kiloliters, whereas before the drought in 2017, I was getting 40 kiloliters before I got to the maximum rate. Now, I'm already at the maximum rate when I get to 15 kiloliters. And back then, I was getting 5 kiloliters for free. Now, I don't get anything for free. And I have to pay a service charge. If I don't use any water, for example, now it's winter, for about seven months of the year, I don't need to buy water because I use rainwater. Okay? But I still have to pay the service charge. And yet, the government should be paying me for saving the water because I'm making sure that we have water in summer because the, I'm not using the water in the dams. I'm making sure that the dams are full at the end of winter myself and thousands like me. So we can have a learning curve in homeowners where we make electricity and therefore there's more electricity for poor people or for factories or because the factories have got more electricity, they can employ more poor people. So whilst the government says, no, David, you've got to pay, I think my, the price in the 1st of July, we're going to look at this in another slide, my price will be 4 Rand a kilowatt hour. So I'll be paying 500 Rand for 150 kilowatt hours. Well, I'm already paying that, so I'll be paying even more. I mean, 500 rand for 150 kilowatt hours is a lot of money right now today. And I have to include VAT, VAT, tax. So yeah, we, we're going deep. We can look at the slide and we can say the learning curve is as you make more, the price comes down. Fine, but we need to go deep. We need to really look underneath this graph and we need to say what's going on here. We need to thank ResearchGate and all the people that have produced this graph and done the, the number of research, so I didn't have to do it. You can see at the bottom there where it comes from, Alberg University, blah, blah. So all of that stuff is there, the Model T. So we haven't even got to some of the things about the Model T. Let's go into the Model T. So what did, what did Ford do? Well, firstly, every single model that came out of the Model T, let's suppose you bought out a new model every year, just like you get a new uh, Ford every year, a new model with new lights and stuff. He didn't do that. He made sure that, that as many parts as possible between models were the same parts. So when the new model came out of the same car, same parts. And the next model, same parts. And the next model, same parts. So the 2020 model of the Model T Ford was using some of the same parts as the 1919 model. That was the first thing he did. The second thing he did is by 2020, he was making lots of different kinds of cars, not just the Model T. So if he was making five or ten different kinds of cars, he made sure that the same parts were used across multiple different cars. So he made sure that as new cars came out and they had more efficiencies and more capabilities, he used the same parts, and across different models, he used the same parts. Now, if he could do that in 2020, why can't car companies do that? So if he could do that in 1920, why can't car companies do that in 2020? Why do we allow people to put the prices up? Why don't we demand that the prices go down every year? And the quality goes up. And the efficiency goes up. 
and the miles per the miles per liter or the kilometers per liter go up? Why don't we demand those things? Why are we not learning? And there's a lot of other learning that we can do. In 2020, why can't we learn faster than in 1920? Why aren't our brains, why haven't we learned how to use our brains in a more clear way? Why are we so stuck on myopic material? Our brains are fogged up. I made another video called Anxiety about brain fog and about why people are so anxious. Watch that video. If I knew how to do this, watch the video. Yeah, I would do that, but I don't know how to do that. I'm not a video editor. I'm a scientist. I'm making scientific videos. If there's someone watching this who's a video editor that wants to do fancy video editing, be my guest. Come on board, and you can be the video editor. But right now, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in giving you scientific facts so that you can make decisions for yourself that are not fake news. And if I tell you something that I think is fake news, I'm going to tell you this information comes from that place, and it could be fake news. Everything I say, by the way, is advice. It's up to you to decide how to use it and to make use of it. I'm not prescriptive. I'm not telling you what to think. I'm telling you that Henry Ford showed over his life, once he started his factory, the Ford factory. He even bought his own power station because he realized that he could make his own electricity cheaper than he could buy it. And while Samuel Insull was making a so-called natural monopoly in Chicago, Samuel Insull at the same time made something called a monopsony. And a monopsony was the only company that could buy the products in South Africa. The only company that you can buy electricity from is ESCOM, unless ESCOM nominates, for example, a municipality to sell electricity on their behalf. But then if I want to sell electricity, the only company that can buy my electricity is ESCOM, or the cities or municipality on their behalf. So I can buy electricity at, say, four rand a kilowatt hour, but if I want to sell it, I can only sell it at 50 cents. Whereas ESCOM are selling electricity to the municipality at one rand 20. So therefore, I should be selling electricity at least at one rand 20. And if you consider that my electricity, if I was allowed to export the electricity, which I don't, I don't export electricity, but if I could, then I could sell the electricity at three rand a kilowatt hour to the the council, and they could sell it to my neighbor at four rand a kilowatt hour, and they could make a one rand markup, and my electricity never touches the transformer. It goes straight out of my house, straight into my neighbor's house, thus reducing the load on the grid. You'll find that CPAC, the California Public Utility, discovered that when there was net metering, the efficiency of transformers went up. The cost of production went down. They didn't need to have service charges. We get told, no, we need to have service charges because we're all using less electricity. But actually, in facts, the facts are that when people do electric, make their own electricity and when they're allowed to export to the grid and when they're allowed to sell to their neighbors indirectly via the grid, because I'm selling at a price, say, three rand, the neighbor's buying at four rand, and therefore the utility is making the money in the middle. Just like the stock exchange. If I sell you a share, I sell the share for one rand, you pay one rand 20, and the stock exchange makes 20 cents in the middle. Same as if, if I want to sell you some rands and, and you want to sell me some dollars, you want to sell me some dollars, and we see the rate is 15 to the dollar, and if we do a one-on-one -on -one exchange, then you give me 15, dollar, 15 rand, so I give you 15 rand, you give me one dollar. But if you go and do this via the stock exchange or via the exchange, the exchange shops, then I've got to give them 16 rand for one dollar. Or you've got to give them $81.20 for 15 rand. And that's how people, are, the middlemen, are making the money in the middle. We're going to talk about middlemen as well and how that has corrupted our system to some extent. And hence why there's blockchain, because blockchain is a direct transaction between buyer and seller. And Luno and other exchanges in the middle make very small amounts of money because they don't need to make a fortune to make enough profit. So I think that we must understand that there's a learning curve. As we make more, the price comes down. The, the efficiency goes up. The quality goes up. So the quality, time, cost, triangle, everything is better. And if this is not working, if over time we start here with a price of $1,000 and by the time we get to $10 million, the price is $5,000, we failed. 
And why have we allowed this to happen? Why have consumers allowed their prices to go up? I mean, we get told that everything's made in China and it's made really cheaply and there's slave labor in China. You know, and if the slave labor is making your shirt, let's suppose you're wearing a, a nice shirt or a nice jersey and it got made in China with slave labor, okay? Then you're going to have negative energy because your jersey was made with slave labor. You wearing, you, you're a slave owner. And the fact that you might not have employed that slave directly, that doesn't matter. From an energy point of view, one of the reasons why there's so much sickness in the world at the moment, one of the reasons why there's so many pandemics, is because if I'm wearing clothes, maybe a million people are involved in the clothes I'm wearing right now. From the farmer, from the person making the nutrition for the farm, the, the, the pesticides and all of those kinds of things on the farm, the chemicals that the farmer uses, the petrol, the oil system, the gas system, the car system, the transport system, the shipping, and then the factories in China or Korea or even in South Africa making the textile goods with machinery made in Germany and France and other parts of the world, America, Switzerland, textile factories, textile factories in Italy, Milan, huge textile in area, all the people designing the textiles, designing the clothes, tens of thousands of them, people sewing, CMT, cut, make, trim, dye houses, finishing, boxing, putting stuff in boxes, transporting the stuff, couriering it to a house, try it on, changing rooms, shopping centers, electricity, water. So I'm wearing jeans and I'm wearing a vest because it's cold. And I'm wearing a shirt and a jersey and I'm wearing socks and I'm wearing slippers. That's what I'm wearing right now. I'm wearing glasses. So if I add the, the production line system with the glasses, I'm wearing my wedding ring, gold. So the gold was mined out of the ground so I could have a wedding ring, a gold wedding ring with all the symbolism. I had to have a haircut so that I could look beautiful for you in this, in this uh, or handsome, depending on your point of view, in this video. So a million people, maybe even 5, 10, 15, 20 million people have been involved in what's in my body and on my body right now. And then there's the food, there's the water. There's so much going on right now. How many people are involved in my life? If one of those people is a slave, I am indirectly responsible for that. And when you consider that they're saying like 15 million or 25 million or something, you can look it up, slaves in the world. Then these are people that are working for a pittance, maybe a bowl of rice a day. Maybe they have to work at the factory. Maybe they don't even have a life. Maybe they're working in places where they have to send money home. Now you think about that. We want to fix our system. We've got a lot of work to do. We've got a hang of a lot of work to do. And my model that I invented in 1999 fixes all of these crises all together. And I want to work with you. I want to work with your company. I want to work with you directly. I want to work with your community. And I don't do the work. What I do is I do knowledge transfer. If you want to have a half an hour presentation like this one about the learning curve, I can do that. If you want to have a three minute presentation or even a 10 second presentation, I can do that too. But if you watch these videos I'm making now and you get the background detail, then by the time I come on site and I do a keynote speech, by the time I talk to a CEO, by the time I talk to board of directors, by the time I talk to executive committee of your community, by the time I talk to accountants, you already have the deep insight you need to be able to make the kinds of decisions you need to make for yourselves to make sure that your system is clean, that your system doesn't impact the environment. that your cost is less and less for yourself and the cost is less and less for the environment and the cost is less and less on the animals and the cost is less and less on all the animals that you'd like to come to South Africa and Africa to see. If you come to the Serengeti and other places like that and you come and look at the lions and all those things, you go to Asia and look at tigers. We don't want to be looking at them in zoos anymore because zoos are out. We want to be looking at them in the natural environment. But if, we, if we're tearing down forests, and orangutans are dying, almost extinct, because we want more oil out of Thailand and those places, Philippines. And we're cutting down forests in Central Africa. I've flown over Central Africa in the middle of the night in plains where it's been not cloudy. And you can see fires burning across those forests because people are burning down the forest because they want to have land 
to for cows. And I'm not saying we shouldn't eat meat, but maybe you should have meat every three months like I do. I have a little steak or something once every three months. It's enough for me. I don't have to eat steak every day. But I like to eat it. It makes you feel good and comfortable. And the Old Testament, the Bible says, one should eat meat on special occasions. Well, obviously, every day is a special occasion because I'm alive. When I wake up in the morning, it's a special occasion. But right now, I don't have to eat meat. I have to eat it on a really special occasion, such as the New Year or the fast break or whatever the case is. Not every day. And this is all part of the learning curve. As I learn more about health, my health cost comes down. As I learn more about food, my food cost might go up. Okay, because I'm buying more and more quality food, but my overall health cost comes down. My overall cost of living comes down. And I mustn't be picking on one number. People will say, but David, you're paying twice as much for this food as the guy next door. And maybe it's true, I am. But for me, the primary thing, as I said in a video before, that goes, in my mind, the primary thing is what I'm eating, what I'm drinking, what I'm breathing, and what's going into my head, what, what, what I'm thinking what consciousness is entering my mind. And that's what you see this, this YouTube channel is called, Being Human. And thanks to Ram, Ram Kumar, Ramesh Ram Kumar, a doctor from Natal who went off, who had a serious health crisis, and went to India for, for a year, and he did a major detox there. And read about it in his book called Being Human. It's fascinating. I don't need to repeat that. He's written it. It's in his book. If he asks me to review it, I'll review it. I've often thought about that. Should I review books? Happy to do it. Not, I'm not sure if it's allowed or not. But I can take everything I know and I can put it together in these videos for you. So we, there must be a learning curve in everything we do. We should be breathing more and more clean air every day. We should be drinking more, better and better quality water. Our milk standards should be increasing, but our milk standards are decreasing. Yes, you heard that correctly. If you go and look at the milk standard from 1990 and you compare it with the milk standard in South Africa, maybe other countries 2020, you'll discover that milk allows more pus today than back then because the demand for milk has outstripped the ability of mankind to produce cows to produce the milk. And therefore, in order to produce the amount of milk we need, the quality has decreased. But then maybe we should be looking at alternatives for milk. Maybe there's other kinds of milk. Maybe there's nut milk. Maybe we don't even need milk. Although, if you don't have sugar in your coffee, it's nice to have a little bit of milk because milk is lactose. It's a form of sugar. So, the learning curve is applicable everywhere, not just in Ford, car, Ford cars or Mercedes Benzes, but it's applicable in your jerseys, it's applicable in your clothes, it's applicable in everywhere. And it doesn't mean that the person who's actually doing the work should earn less and less, and the middleman and the retailer should earn more and more. So, the guy who made my jersey which maybe this jersey costs $50. It's quite an expensive jersey. Maybe the person that made it only got $1. And then the middleman got $10. And then the shop I bought it from got $30. And that's really unfair. It's very, very unfair. It's very, very unfair that the person that took the most risk is paid the least. And that's something we need to look at. There should be no need for slave labor in the world today, in 2022. And if we don't stop this, parasites are going to get worse because everything we get from nature, when we get a parasitic disease that causes us to be unable to breathe, it's because nature is telling us, hey, humans, I can't breathe. I'm sending you a breathing illness. What do you do? You stay at home for two years. Great. Everybody's at home for two years. And if you watch other videos I made, you'll see the canals in Venice got clean. People said they'd never get clean. But after three weeks, they were clean. After lockdown started, people stopped cruising. People stopped flying. People in Bangladesh or in parts of India, Mumbai, one guy said, I can see God because for the first time in 30 years, he could take off his mask that he had to wear for 30 years and had to run air cleaners at home because of the terrible pollution. And the capital of Pakistan, we know someone there. They've got an air cleaner in every single room in the house. Because the pollution is so bad in that city. And they wear masks all the time, whether there's COVID or not. They have to wear masks. We want all of our inputs to be improving. We want their quality to be going up constantly. 
We want the time to get them to be coming down because their abundance is going up. And we want their cost to be coming down. That is a pure quality cost time triangle. But we get told, we get taught in business school. If you want the quality to go up and you want the time to go down, then the cost must go up. Or if you want the cost to come down, then the quality must come down. Or the time must go up. This is false. It's completely false. I'm sorry to say. And obviously when I learned about this, when I did an MBA in 1992, I thought it was true. But it's not true. If we have the learning curve, which is the subject of this talk, then the quality must be going up all the time. The time to manufacture must be coming down all the time. And the cost must be coming down all the time. We don't have to have this thing where if we want to make the best quality, we've got to have the highest price. There's lots of things that we make that have fantastic quality and low price. For example, what you buy at your corner grocer. Or we get stuff from the farm. There's a farm in Franschuk that delivered to us. And we get fantastic quality goods at a really low price, delivered in a cold truck by a very friendly guy. They even tell us it's going to arrive at 9.34 a.m. They don't say it's going to arrive by 10 o'clock. It's going to arrive between 9 and 10. They give you the precise minute the truck is going to get to your house. I've never seen that before. We pay 250 rand for a fresh box of vegetables. We don't even know what we're going to get because it's vegetables in season. And Maimonides, a great rabbi from the 12th century, and a consultant to the kings or sultans of Turkey, he said you should eat food in its season. So the season in South Africa right now, in the southern hemisphere winter, so there is lots and lots of fruit with vitamin C because you need vitamin C in winter. Strawberries are a summer fruit. We should not be eating strawberries in winter. Yet, today, you can get strawberries all year round. We get apples all year round because we have massive apple sheds, and maybe it's okay to eat apples all year round. I certainly like, like eating an apple every day. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. Remember that? One of the reasons is because an apple cleans your teeth. If you're not going to brush your teeth, at least eat an apple before you go to bed or in the evening after you've had supper. We need to listen to ancient wisdom. We need to see what's going on. We need to reduce our cost for ourselves. We need to reduce our cost on our environment so that there are more animals, there's more fish in the sea, there's more crustaceans, there's more whales. There's better quality water. There's better quality food. When I go to hospital, I worked in a hospital in South Africa for six months in 2019. I was shocked at the state of the hospital toilets. I was shocked at the state of the furniture, etc. And I was especially and mostly shocked at the state of the restaurant and the food it was serving. That's such a fantastic opportunity to serve the best quality organic food at the cheapest possible price made locally with a 100-mile diet. Where everything is made within 100 miles of where you buy it, 160 kilometers, to show people how to eat. If you teach people how to eat, you keep them out of hospitals. And as the world got more healthy at the beginning of COVID, believe it or not, trillions of animals, hundreds of trillions of animals were saying, thank you, humans, for staying at home. Thank you for allowing us to go, us coyotes, American foxes, to go trotting on that big bridge in California, the Golden Gate Bridge. The penguins in in um, Simon's Town in Cape Town to go waddling down the main road because there weren't any cars in Cape Town. The people in Mumbai who could see God because there was no pollution. God shut us down for a reason, to teach us how to look after the planet. But all we want to do is go back to the office in a building. My office is at my house. My office has been at my house since ADSL arrived in South Africa in 2002. That's when I moved my office to my house. Before that, my office was in my clients. Every client I had, I had a desk in the client. After that, some clients, I kept the desk, but mostly I didn't need the desk anymore. 
and therefore my transport cost has come down. My pollution has come down. My maintenance bill has come down. I don't spend much money on cars. I don't spend much money on transport compared to my friends. My main priority is to make sure what goes into my body is pure. It's quality. It's making me healthy. I want to make sure that the clothing I wear is the best possible quality at the least possible relative price and that there haven't been anybody, any slaves involved. And if there are, every night or every morning when I do my daily prayers, I pray for forgiveness that I'm wearing clothes that may be made by slaves and that I pray that they will be freed as soon as possible. And if they're not free physically, then their minds should be free. Because once your mind is free, you get something called redemption. And once you get redemption, you get something called revelation. And if you are redeemed, you'll live. People that survived concentration camps believed in the future. They believed in God, even amongst, even at a time of terrible anguish. They believed in the goodness that there are good people out there that will come and help them and not steal from them. We must apply the learning curve in everything we do. The cost of everything must come down. Not just, and it mustn't just be because production goes up. Let's suppose I only need 10,000 a month of something. When I make 10,000 this month, it costs X. When I make 10,000 next month or next year, it should cost X. 90% of X. When I make 10,000 the next year, it must cost 80% of X, etc. Every year when I make 10,000, the price should be coming down by 10%. If it's not, I'm not doing my job. Even with inflation, it should be coming down. In fact, there shouldn't be inflation. We can spend hours talking about why inflation is ridiculous. That inflation is caused because of our system, which if you saw in the previous slide, I spoke about exponential growth. Exponential growth causes inflation. We get told that deflation is bad. But with inflation, I put a thousand rand in the bank this year, and I can go and buy, say, 100 loaves of bread. Next year, I can only buy... 90 loaves of bread. But with deflation, if I could buy 100 loaves of bread this year, I could buy 110 loaves of bread next year, which would force people to save. It would incentivize people to save because people would know that their savings is values going up faster than inflation. In fact, it's deflating, which means that it's becoming more valuable. That's what we want. Over time, as we get older, we need to be, get, be getting more valuable. Our values must be increasing, not decreasing. So the learning curves on values must be increasing. So I want to bless you that you'll understand the learning curve, that you'll take what I'm saying and talk about it with your friends, with your colleagues, with your wife, your husband, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your mother, your father, your child, your boss, and each of these subjects that you'll talk about them and try and go deep. Try to find out what's underneath. I bless you that you find the wisdom from the words I've said. I bless you that you speak to each other and look for the wisdom in the words that each other give you. I bless you that we find ways to get rid of slavery in the world. I bless you and all of us that we find ways to be more healthy together and that we find ways to make our world and planet more healthy. Amen.